Am I on? Yeah, I'm on. All right. Let's get started. Um, so first of all, thanks, everybody. Thanks for showing up. It's the end of the day. It's the end of the conference. You could have been having a beer or food or something, but you're here. So I'll try to make it worth it. Um, we're going to talk about keyless signing uh, without Fulcio. Um, so keyless signing is this, this signing uh, pattern that was popularized by SIGStore, where you don't have to think, the end user doesn't have to think about uh, managing their, their, their keys. And I want to sort of demystify what keyless signing is and show that you can also create the same flow without having um, to use SIGStore. You can use off-the-shelf components and get the same kind of experience. OK, so if you love this talk or if you hate this talk, uh, here's how to get a hold of me afterwards. Uh, I have the kind of pleasure of working with uh, ChainGuard, uh, so I get to think about this kind of thing uh, throughout the day for work, which is wonderful. And then you can find my GitHub or, or Mastodon handles there to, to say hello or, or whatever you'd like. And so here's how this is going to go down. Uh, first, we're going to take a look at what the experience of keyless signing is. Uh, just what does signing look like for an end user? and and just show uh, just that user experience and what the value is, first of all. And if you haven't managed keys before, we're going to take a look at what that feels like <laughs> a little bit. Um, we're going to sign something with a, a key, a key pair, and then um, see some of the pain points and, and feel that um, what can go wrong, essentially. And then if we're in the position to want to build something similar, but we don't want to use SIGStore for whatever reason, we're going to take a look at keyless signing step by step and understand the components that we need to run ourselves to get the same experience for, for our users if we don't want to use the, the public good instance or for whatever reason we don't want to use all the components of SIGStore's uh, open source services. Um, OK, so the first bit about keyless signing being fun. It is. It's, it's fantastically easy, especially if you've gone through the alternatives of signing any other way in the past. Um, we're going to see some examples with Cosign. This is Sigstore's uh, CLI client that just makes it a lot easier to use these, um, these uh, services to sign things. And really, all you need to do to sign a container with Cosign is to just type Cosign sign and the digest of the container that you want to sign. Like, that's it. Um, the user experience that happens right after this, if you haven't done this before, is if you're uh, a person, you're going to get you know, a browser is going to pop open and prompt you to log in with an identity provider. Google, GitHub, Microsoft, that list might grow in the future. But basically, how do you want to sign this image? Which identity do you want to use? And just prompt you to log in. And that's the identity that's going to be attached to the signature on this, this container. Um, there are some variations on this. If you're running the same command inside of some kind of workload, Cosign is going to kind of look around and try to figure out who you are. Maybe if it looks at an environment variable and sees a GitHub uh, ID token environment variable, OK, we're in GitHub Actions, and it's going to use that identity to sign. If it's in um, Kubernetes, it might find the service account token and use that identity. So if you're a workload, it's not going to prompt you to log in. It's just going to try to figure out who are we, essentially. Um, and there's some other, yeah, OK, so, so this is it. And then a small aside. Uh, soon you'll have to use a digest because signing a tag doesn't really mean anything. Um, the content can change, and then what are we even talking about on the signature? So that's going to be a, a required thing soon. And I think the magic of this keyless uh, signing is, is really this part, when you verify a signature. Um, the aspect that you want to sort of look at here is we get to say cosign verify. We point to the same uh, image digest. And then we talk about the signer. We don't talk about keys. In this case, if I was signing with my uh, Google login, we talk about my email address. That's the alias for, for me. Oh, sorry. And we talk about according to who, uh, according to accounts.google.com. Um, there's variations on this, obviously. You could say, I want it to be according to uh, the GitHub Actions identity provider, and I care about the specific uh, workflow to have signed the image. Um, soon there'll be support for uh, a couple other providers like GitLab and BuildKite in the works. So hopefully this will be ubiquitous across uh, CI providers and other workload identities uh, soon. Um, so there's some variations on this verification process. You can run this as um, a Kubernetes admission webhook. So there's Caverno support. I, I believe Gatekeeper might have support now. I'm not sure. But there's also a, uh, a controller called the policy controller from SIGStore itself that can help you check you know, signatures and reject images that don't match a policy, essentially. right? Um, this is really awesome. 
Um, as an end user, uh, if you don't know anything about public key cryptography, you still didn't need to do anything and know anything about public key cryptography, and you can hold it right and not mess up, not switch the private key and the public key or store something incorrectly. Um, you don't need to know that the keys even exist in this case, so there's nothing to mismanage, which is really wonderful. But if you've never had to manage keys, you might not know how bad that can be. So let's take a look at uh, managing keys um, and see what that experience is like. Uh, so Cosign can, can also sign things with a, with a key pair. And the first thing you need to do, uh, whether you use Cosign or not, is to generate a, a key pair, private and public. Uh, if you use Cosign to do it, it'll look kind of like this. Uh, ask you for a little uh, password to encrypt the private key. And then it'll write out two files, the public key, it's cosign.pub here, and the private key, cosign.key is the name of the file here. Um, the private key is the kind of sensitive bit. Um, there's some variations on this too. The private key can be managed in like a cloud KMS system where you can only access to sign over an API instead of having the actual key content on disk. But um, some of the pain points end up being kind of similar even in that use case when you're not managing that. And there's different tools you can use like OpenSSL or uh, the STEP CLI to, to generate these kind of key pairs and, and use them for signing. And the experience of signing always kind of looks a little bit like this. So here using Cosign, we point to the same kind of image and then we pass in the private key uh, to sign with. So you need to know to use the private key for signing. And then when you're verifying, you pass in the public key. Again, you could use you know, Kubernetes admission control and stick the public key inside of your little CRD to say, you know, it needs to have, be signed by this thing. And this is gonna check in, in the case of keyless and in the case of uh, keyed signing, it's gonna check that the contents of the container haven't been shifted, kind of like a hash. Um, but in the case of this check with the public key, it's gonna check that it was signed by the private key. If that's the, the verification that's happening. And like, it doesn't look like that bad really. <laughs> like it's just, make sure that you handle the private key and stick it where you wanna sign and then take the public key wherever you wanna verify, right? It's, it's not bad when it's one key. One key is actually, this is like the temptation that leads you down the path of like despair. Um, you only really need to know a little bit about the keys, you know, always verify with public, always sign with private, and don't leak the private one out there, otherwise people could sign with it, right? Um, so let's ask a couple questions to kind of move beyond just like one key pair. Like, this is maybe a situation that you have, like I wanna verify that the things I run in my production systems were built in my build system, right? Like, we should all be able to answer that question. That's, that's like entry points to software security, software supply chain security, right? And the way that you would solve this uh, to kind of fix this, this it with key management is, okay, well, we'll generate a key pair, stick the private key over in your build system, sign stuff in your build system by accessing it maybe from some secret store or something, and then you take your public key and wherever you're about to run your containers or your software, verify before running and then reject stuff that, that isn't signed. So in this case, you start to see the pattern that emerges with, with these key pairs is that the public key becomes this kind of alias for the build system. And we know that it's the build system because we only gave the private key to the build system. But if you wanna have like slightly more nuanced language around verification, like in this Kubernetes namespace, I would like to make sure that, um, that it was built and signed by a particular CI workflow. The only way that you can discriminate between the different signers in this case, the different CI workflows, is to give them all different private keys to sign. Otherwise, your statement can't be verified because you can't distinguish between the different signers, right? So again, the keys have become sort of an alias for, i.e., this particular signer, and they hold on onto it for a long time. Uh, at this point, you better start to kind of like track them somehow because just by looking at the key material, you, you don't know where you stuck it and which pipeline and it gets to be a little bit chaotic tracking where you put each one, right? You might have a lot of pipelines too. Uh, okay, like your CI provider also probably is gonna get jacked at some point and people will take your private keys, right? Like no one is immune. If you, if you create a secret store, people will attack it, right? Um, the tough bit here is you need to make sure you create a new key pair, put the new public key in place to verify against both public keys, sign with the, the new private key, distribute 
you know, a build for everything and then get the new builds everywhere and then remove the, the old public key from the verification policy. It's, it's work, but you know, it happens, right? Uh, but you were maybe signing things for customers and they were verifying with those keys. It starts to get rough now, like talk to PR, right? You have to do the same thing, but you also have to deal with the fact that you just kind of busted your customer's trust a little bit. And they're just kind of thinking like, how long until it happens again? I mean, the news cycle's rough, right? Um, it just kind of keeps on going on like this. You know, if, you have, if you're a big company, it's, it's too much. If you have a public key, where's the private key? Like, no, it, believe me, it's painful. And like, the literature is riddled with like, public key management or just key management just being a brutally hard problem. So if we can get rid of it, it's a good idea. Um, so exactly what is it that, about the keyless uh, pattern that is actually better? The thing that is actually better is, is the verification process, um, really. Uh, you only talk about who the signer's identity is, and that's it. And that's what verification should look like. You're trying to assert who signed this thing. Um, so let's look at a different example, like uh, verifying in Kubernetes admission webhooks. Um, so if you were using a SigStore's policy controller, uh, this is a little bit what the CRD would look like. And the thing that I really want to draw attention to is, you know, there's a pattern for what the images look like, gcr.io, foo, something. There's some details there about CT log and keyless. But the, the thing that's very important is what's highlighted in color. And again, like all keyless verification should have this property where you just say, I, I demand that the, the signer was this, you know, this identity provider, this, this uh, particular subject, and maybe even a bit of a pattern matching thing where you say like, I trusted this subject, you know, most of the time, but November was a bad month, they were compromised. And then, you know, I care about the subjects looking like this pattern or something like that. But, so it can be flexible, it doesn't have to be one exact workflow. So this is what it might look like for, uh, for someone to say trust a particular GitHub, uh, GitHub workflow, if that makes sense. Okay, so can we build our own? Um, there's a lot of people right now building signing systems inside their companies. Um, they have a lot of different constraints. Um, and I guess what I'm trying to say with this whole kind of presentation is that it should be keyless. Um, you should really, really question yourself if when people are verifying the signatures on your signing system, if they need to reference a key ever. Uh, it's just not a position you want to put your developers in because then they have to manage them and understand what that key means and what is this like referring to, right? It, it's going to get bad eventually. And so how can we get the same kind of keyless design even if we decide that like six source actual open source systems don't fit whatever your, your requirements are. Okay, so there's, there's kind of some analogies here about why you might want to build your own, right? Um, if you're building like WebPKI, right, there's a big one that is open source, Let's Encrypt. Um, and it's a designed in a particular way to deal with a large publicly trusted, being a large publicly trusted CA. Um, it has a very large target on its back, so it's designed a particular way, right? But you can use like Boulder's, uh, Let's Encrypt's Boulder CA if you wanted to. But when people have private instances of a, of a web PKI, they, they often don't. They often choose different technology that's built for smaller private certificate authorities. If you're running a Kubernetes cluster, you have a CA, you know it's baked into the API server. If you're running a, a service mesh, you also have a CA, right, that becomes that root of trust for, for all the communication inside of your service mesh. And people also will kind of build them out of, you know, small step or vault, OpenSSL maybe is the wrong example to use here, but you could use that too if you wanted to, um, to build these sort of smaller systems with a different set of constraints. Maybe certificate transparency, which, you know, uh, Let's Encrypt has to have, isn't something you need for your service mesh. Um, so I guess the question is, if SigStore is kind of the, the big public um, code signing, uh, let's encrypt, if you will, um, what are the options if we are trying to make something with different requirements that's private? Does it need to be the same? And I don't mean to say by any means here that um, SigStore itself shouldn't be your first option. It should, it's fantastic. And 
it's built to be extremely secure. So it's a great option, but if you discover you have already an existing X509 like certificate authority that you need to use for whatever reason from other, some other team has put this constraint on you, let's see, like can we still get the same behavior basically? Okay, so to figure out how you can do this yourself, we're gonna look at the keyless signing process in detail when you use SigStore, and then we're gonna keep like a little grocery list along the way uh, for the stuff that we need to run ourselves if we're trying to get the same properties, okay? So that's the way it's gonna go. So when you're using Cosign, like the, the first example there to sign a container, the, the first step for Cosign is to figure out who is using Cosign. <laughs> so who are you, who's, who's calling me? And that, you know, we talked a little bit around like looking around in the environment if it's a, if it's a workload. Um, if it's a person and it can't find anything, it's just gonna pop open a browser and, and say, log in, tell me, tell me who you are. And the response from that is gonna be uh, specifically for SigStore, it's gonna be an OIDC ID token that describes who the user is, um, along with according to who, like according to Google, according to Microsoft, that kind of thing. Um, and that brings us to Basically, grocery list item number one is to think about the identity provider you will use for your signers. If these are, these are like CI workloads, they need to have a strong sense of identity, and the identity is gonna be tied through the whole system all the way to the end so that the verifiers can use that language, the same language as the identity provider, to describe who they wanted to sign their systems. But in your system, it doesn't have to be an OIDC identity provider. Thankfully, that's actually being baked into a lot of CI providers these days. CircleCI has one, GitHub Actions, GitLab. It's becoming more ubiquitous, but if your system for workload identity is spiffy and they're, you know, X509, SVID docs, that could work too. If you're building things in AWS and your identity provider in that case is AWS AIM, that's a perfectly fine identity provider, uh, so long as it works with the rest of the system, and we're, we're gonna talk about that. But that's one thing to think up upfront is who's signing? Is it people, is it workloads? And how am I gonna identify them, right? All right, next step. Cosign knows who we are now. All right, so the, the next step is that Cosign's gonna create a private key. And this is a keyless flow, but don't, don't worry, we're gonna throw it in the garbage really soon, I swear. <laughs> um, okay, so it's gonna create a private key in memory. And then it's gonna take the public key uh, conjugate to that and that ID token about who the signer is. And it's going to pass that up to Falsio, which is SigStore's certificate authority. And what it's asking for is a short-lived code signing cert. So Falsio is gonna take a look at that identity. And remember, we have to wire the identity all the way through to the end so that someone can verify just with that identity, like me at example.com. It needs to make it all the way to the end process. So Falsio is gonna stick that metadata inside of the certificate along with the public key, because that's certificates are, always have the public key inside them as well, and pass that back to Cosign. And now the key property here is that the certificate is going to expire very soon. I think the default on Cosign uh, for Falsio for the, the public instance is 10 minutes. You could and should maybe make yours short. The idea is to get a certificate for every signature. Um, yeah. So the shorter the time window, the better. And what's really great about this is when, you're, when you have uh, certificates or you're issuing for a minute or two, um, certificate revocation is just out of the question. Like there's no reason to have a certificate revocation list um, with windows that short. They're about to, you know, they're about to expire anyways. Um, okay, so that's item number two, is that certificate authority is gonna, be ha gonna have to be in your system somewhere. Because if you're just using public keys by themselves, there's no additional metadata about the validity period. And the certificate authority is giving us two things. It's pushing the identity information into the cert to pair it up with the public key. And it's also giving us that window of it's only valid for you know, five minutes or something like that, which, which is the magic of certificate authorities. Metadata on top of public keys, right? Um, so there's lots of different open source you know, certificate authorities. I think, you know, in spirit, you could probably do this with like an SSH certificate authority because you can do signatures with those two, but we'll keep our discussions to X509. So the same kind of certificate authorities you see for uh, TLS, just with different data inside them, inside the metadata. And 
the key bit here when you're choosing uh, your certificate authority is that it needs to understand your identity provider. So when you're choosing that, and you know that your identity provider was, for instance, it was going to be AWS I am. the certificate authority needs to understand that and be able to exchange those credentials for certs. That's what we have to keep in our head. Or you need to glue it together somehow to make that possible. Okay, next bit. We have our private key, and we sign our artifact with it, and that gives us back a little bit of data, the signature, and then we chuck the private key in the garbage. Nothing more for our list now. That, that's just something we'll be able to do. So no, no more things, uh, no more requirements. I think the only thing to remember here is we're kind of on the clock at this point. The certificate's gonna expire soon, so we better sign quickly. That's, that's kind of the only design requirement. Okay, next. So what happens next in Cosign is that um, it tells, it needs to go tell Recore, which is the signature transparency log, that it, it made a signature. So this is one of these really interesting and excellent security features of, of, of uh, SigStore is that there's signature transparency. So each signature that happens ends up in a signature transparency log. And Cosign is gonna tell, uh, Cosign is gonna tell Recore this signature transparency log, I've signed something, next. So it's gonna pass the signature it just created and the certificate that it signed with up to Recore. And Recore is going to give basically all that stuff back, but it's going to add a timestamp and sign the whole bundle. So the certificate, the timestamp, and the artifact signature are all going to be signed by Recore. Now, it's not signature transparency. That's, that's what gives um, SigStore this keyless feature. Signature, signature transparency is great, but it's not the keyless bit. What's happening here to make keyless possible is that this is a verifiable timestamp of when the signature happened. And Recore doesn't need to necessarily be the thing that does this, but you must have something do it. So the key element here, the last thing that we're gonna put on our grocery list is a timestamping authority. Now, if you decide that you want signature transparency because it has a lot of great properties in its own right, you could run Recore if you want, as the signature, as the timestamping authority. But you can also run timestamping authorities that only do these timestamps and don't actually have this big signature append-only log if that's what you don't want to have. They're a little bit simpler to operate as well. Um, okay, so that's it. We have the three things on our list. We have an identity provider, a certificate authority, and a timestamping authority. And then the final question a little bit here is, that was a lot of stuff, like a lot of bundle came out of this, like how did that turn into someone just saying, you know, cosign verify this email address and this identity provider, right? There's, uh, this is what's in the hands of a verifier, okay? And here's how verification works and what you need to implement if you wanna make this keyless magic kind of work, right? You have the, the signature of the bundle, of the big time stamped bundle, and you have, we have our certificate, we have our signature, we have the artifact in hand, you have to ship all of this stuff to the end user. What's happening in Cosign, if you signed a container, is that this is all attached onto um, an OCI image right beside your, the image you care about. So it's all stuck there inside your OCI registry, usually. Um, so here's the process. We kind of have to peel this thing like an onion. Uh, so outside layers first, and we're gonna make our way inside. The first bit is to just verify the signature of the bundle. So Recore, in this case, uh, has a public key. We verify that this signature was signed with Recore's public key, which kind of removes the bundle, which means that we trust that the signature happened at a particular time, and we know that the, what the timestamp is, essentially. The next part is to check that the certificate is valid. Now, it's really important right here that we don't use the normal certificate validation flow that you would see like in TLS, because this certificate is very likely already expired in that sense. What we need to do is do most of that aspect, make sure that it chains up to our certificate authority, but then when it comes to the time of validity, we just need to check that the timestamp is inside of the validity window for the certificate. So that's a modification you need to make from the normal you know, TLS kind of verification. So that kind of pops off the certificate from the, the onion, and then Second last thing, yeah, go ahead. 
The time, yeah, the timestamp was signed in the original bundle. So if I go back here, the signature is over the entire bundle, which includes the time, the signature, and the certificate. So we, we kind of verify that the time was accurate insofar as we trust Recor in the first step there. Yeah. Um, so then we, ch we check that we trust the certificate authority. Um, and then second last is we check the signature actually is valid. So we take the artifact, the public key, and check the signature. And after that's done, we're remaining with the thing the user actually asks. And they put that input in and say, do I trust me at example.com? It's just the identity metadata left here. Do I trust these details? And those could be very arbitrary for your situation. It could be AWS you know, role ARN. It, it could be all, all kinds of, you know, you can stick whatever you want in an OIDC token. So if it matters to you, it, this is business logic, right? It could be your own thing. OK, so let's do a couple examples. I talked a little bit about AWS. So here's maybe you're building things in AWS cloud uh, code build. So we just need to choose three, these three things. We get an identity provider for free, right? We use AWS as one if we wanted to. We don't have to, but we can. We could choose, for instance, HashiCorp Vault as the certificate authority. Um, if y'all have ever used HashiCorp Vault, you know, Swiss Army knife of many security things, um, you can use AWS as an auth method. You know, so you can authenticate using AWS identities. And then you can exchange that for a certificate, secret, they will call them. So you can issue short-lived certificates that would totally fit this need. And then the last bit is you do need to choose a timestamping authority. So Sigstore uh, has an open source one that you could just grab off the shelf and, and use for this purpose, basically. Or you could choose Recore here, or you could try to find another one that is sort of, I think the RFC is 3161, that's a timestamping spec that you could use. Um, but there's, there's options. Let's think about maybe uh, signing with a corporate identity provider. Maybe you want to sign git commits this way, and you want to use like your Okta or something. OK, so if you have Okta, you can create most of these corporate identity providers have you know, the capacity to make an OIDC compatible app you know, that'll speak OIDC after people log in. And a great option here, too, another open source one, is to use StepCA. So StepCA has these, uh, this, the notion of a provisioner. Which credentials can I exchange for which certificates? And certificate templating. So you can give StepCA an OIDC token from your Okta app or from any other place, and templating the values from the, from the token into extensions inside of your certificate. So that, that'll give you that mapping into your certificate details. So they're called provisioners with StepCA. And then the templating is, a, is attached to a provisioner. And then again, you just kind of choose a timestamping authority. Maybe you care about signature transparency in this case, so we'll choose Recore. So this is the kind of feeling to get the magical three things together and get this key, keyless kind of flow. OK, I'm going to give good news first, which means you know that the bad news is coming. Um, you can keep signing with Cosign. Um, it's already got flags for a situation just like this. Um, if you're using StepCA, for instance, uh, you can get a certificate with StepCA certificate. Here's you know, grabbing one from me at example.com. Um, Cosign needs to have a particular format for the private keys. So you use this import uh, private key command to, to structure it correctly. And then in signing, you just do cosign sign. You know, you, you point to the private key, which you can throw out right after signing. So that's the keyless aspect. You point to the certificate you have, and then you have to have a root bundle that chains up to your, to your root, and then point to your image. Um, yeah. The bad news is that we can't verify very easily in cosign right now. Cosign's verification really understands specifically Falsio at this moment. So you can imagine if you stuffed all kinds of arbitrary extensions inside of those certificates, the very last unpeeling of the onion, it would be like, ah, I'm not really sure what to do here. Um, so you'd kinda, you need to write your own verification logic, and that's the pain point right now. Unless you make your certificates very similarly structured to what Falsio is doing. And you can almost pull that off, but you, if you have arbitrary metadata, you, you can't really get there, right? And that's probably why you're doing this in the first place. Um, but the future is brighter. Uh, there's a couple rough plans to make this just extensible. So the, I think the dream would be for everyone to have the first parts of the keyless bit, you know, the timestamping bundle being verified, um, the certificate being verified, and then all of that just be shared inside of Cosign's verification logic. And then I think what some of the, the hope is here is just to 
have an arbitrary Rego policy or queue or whatever you love for your, your verification language at the end to verify the really particular details of your certificate structure so that people can bring their own PKI and get the same you know, really unique flow, right? So come join the effort. Um, we're you know, obviously looking for contributors at all times. And we can, if we write the logic to, to verify once, then, then we all share it and we can all audit it together, right? Um, and then just finally, a couple of key takeaway thoughts. Please stop managing keys, especially if you're writing a new uh, code signing infrastructure right now or if you're, if you're consulting with people. It, it's going to cause you pain in the future. And you can take the off-the-shelf components and, and do better already um, and not get in this pattern of trying to worry about where you put all your private keys. And then if you're in this pattern or you're even going to use SigStore, start thinking now about the identity provider that you're going to use and, and to, to sign with and, and hence to verify with. So is there actually a strong sense of identity inside your CI system? Um, that's the biggest one, because it's not true everywhere, right? And then I guess the last one is uh, come get involved uh, with uh, making verification for just bring your own PKI uh, uh, shared upstream, essentially, so that it's easier. We don't have to have the right to the same verification logic. So thank you. That's it. minutes if anyone has questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I, I think that's part of the reason some people look for something else is that uh, Fullseal in particular can be a little rigid. You know, it's not meant to be this extensible system that can take an arbitrary identity and exchange it. Um, Step CA was one that I found kind of just would take whatever, and it, it worked worked really well, and I could test that way. But I think that there's something that we can all do better here to take. Hopefully, with more of these implementations, I think we need, frankly, some standards on that structure so that when any kind of verifier sees a keyless looking bundle, you know, the verification is, is clear. And then I think the other one is, I don't know if we have, and I think that we should kind of have a bit more of a, what is the shape of exchanging something that is not OIDC for a certificate? It, it, and what's that look like essentially? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I have great advice for you other than to try different certificate authorities to make it at least easier to prototype, I think, because it is it is tricky. Yeah, it is possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is that using the JWT SFIDs or, or X509 that you're trying to do? Um, ideally, X509. Yeah, exactly. So, and that's one that's like even further away from easy right now, I think, in full CO. You can make it work if you're not here. Right, right. <laughs> cool, cool. Any other questions? Uh, thank you. All right. Well, I'll, I'll be around, and uh, you know where to find me. You'll see these slides up. So thank you so much for coming. Cheers.